Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce uh, our next speaker, who I've had the privilege to get to know uh, over the course of the last, uh, let's say, six months to a year uh, on a variety of different occasions, uh, Dr. Jürgen Janssen. Dr. Jürgen Janssen is head of the German Global Compact Network. He studied initially agricultural economics and marketing at the universities of Bonn and Humboldt. Before starting to work for the German Global Compact, Dr. Janssen held a number of consultation and managerial roles, acting as a senior consultant for companies, including the John Lewis Partnership 2HM, uh, and 2HM Associates. He has since moved into the field of international trade and development, beginning with a project a manager role at the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. Since January 2011, he has worked for the German Global Compact Network. The lecture topic today uh, is a common ground for differentiated sustainable business, the UN Global Compact, and the concept of globality. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Dr. Jürgen Janssen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dornfeld, for this, <coughs> first of all, for the opportunity to speak here and also for the kind introduction. Um, I would, I would put something, I'm, I'm not the director of the German Global Compact Network, I'm the national contact point of the Global Compact, so the, maybe we come to that later. Um, I was asked to, to give a, an input on, on the opportunities or, or also on the, uh, the possibilities and also the threats and challenges when it comes to differentiation, when it comes to local marketing, to nation branding and so on. Um, and I put on my uh, global compact glasses and then try to, to view these questions of nation branding and also of, of, of locality and global um, reach here. Um, so first of all, um, talking for the German Global Compact Network, I'm not a member of the UN. I'm just a representative of the German Global Compact Network. This is something different. We are something like a franchise uh, of the UN. Um, Global Compact, the International Sustainability Initiative of the United Nations. Um, I would like to talk to you about a bit, a few minutes, about the origins of the International Sustainability Initiatives. There were a lot of them over the past few decades. Um, I would like to talk to you about the Global Compact itself, which is the business, about the business um, contribution and the responsibility to sustainable development. We got the macroeconomic view um, from um, Dr. Superchai this morning, and I'll try to break it down a bit uh, to the core regulatory system of the Global Compact. Locality, what, what is this? Well, it's a mixture of, of global and locality, which means, well, nothing uh, other than thinking uh, global and acting local. And I do not want to provide you with a boring, long uh, lecture, as, as uh, you see in the schedule. Um, I would like to give you a short, shorter input, and then I'm very happy to set the frame for a lively and interesting discussion. That I told you already about. You know this, um, if you are on this picture, um, maybe I, I, I come back to the, the topic of, of nation branding, which is the topic of, of the whole conference of a few days of it. What, what is this, what is nation branding all about? It's certainly about cultural identity, it's about people, how they behave, how they feel, it's about tradition. It's certainly also about the, a good or nice environment, um, it's about nature, but it's also about politics and the economy and products and services. Um, Nation branding, why are, are countries going into this? I think we have the ITB now in Berlin. Well, tourism uh, is a, a very important aspect of nation branding. Conserving cultural identity, conserving the environment. But from my experience also uh, as a researcher um, a few years ago, when we looked into especially nation branding topics, it's mostly about self-marketing and positioning a nation and its image as a product. Um, this is very crucial to the concept. This is a very strong driver um, of, this whole, um, of this whole exercise of nation branding. There is a product country nexus, as you will see, with this food from France, uh, uh, garments uh, from, from Italy, uh, uh, technical gadgets from Japan, and now increasingly also from China, and, and, and there are quite a lot of things. Um, high 
prize cars from Germany. There are also something like product country images, which is the marketing concept behind it. And if there are images and there is a marketing concept behind it, there is the need to di differentiate. Because the only way or reason we do marketing, uh, marketing countries, marketing products, is that we are different from others and people buy it or like it, whatsoever you want to need. But from the global compact perspective and also from the sustainability perspective and also from the policy making perspective, we have to ask ourselves how far can and should this differentiation, this being different, um, how far should it go? Um, and then is, is, is growth in trade, uh, is building dams, is this, what, what does it say for the concept of sustainability? I would like to talk about a few of these things because we are talking here about the tragedy of the commons with quite a few um, things that affect us all. First, I think you all know these when you, are, when you are familiar to the international discussion. These are the Millennium Development Goals as a responsibility and negotiated between governments and a responsibility for governments, societies and increasingly also business to help achieve those goals. They are uh, due to expire in 2015 and there is now the discussion on on the post-2015 development agenda with uh, the UN system is gaining trajectory and also the major groups concerning the NGOs, concerning the women uh, uh, organizations, uh, the children's organizations and, and, and are all lining up to uh, input into the discussion. Um, we are very keen and, and uh, well interested in looking what's happening because also the Global Compact is asked to provide an input to the business major group inputs to the um, post-2015 development agenda. We don't know yet what will happen. Um, I think the, the train goes a bit into the direction, not so strong a focus on development, but more uh, on merging development and sustainability together. But how this will work out, there is no well, a few indications, but no, no real signals yet. The origins. When we look back, sustainability concepts, why? Because we are talking about commons, um, products or, or things that can be used by everybody and you cannot exclude uh, anybody, so they affect everybody else. So we had the, the first Club of Rome wake-up call. Then we had the discussion at the UN level, the Brundtland uh, Commission with its definition of sustainability as a global concept and not as a local uh, concept. So nothing you can, should differentiate. And then in 1999, uh, 2000, the UN system strongly started advocating um, by Kofi Annan um, the idea of bringing business um, stronger or of, of integrating business into all aspects of development because business has, as he writes rightly, quite a bit of a capacity to do good and also has a, well, quite a few adverse uh, impacts on sustainability, be it on the human rights aspect and social dimension of, of uh, sustainability, be it uh, on the environmental um, aspects of sustainability, but also be it on the financial stability aspects, economic stability aspects uh, of, of sustainability. So these are the, a few of the origins of the uh, discussions we are now seeing or accumulating last year in the uh, Rio Plus 20 uh, conference um, with its, uh, well, not so strong in, in our feeling, not so strong results when it comes to a sustainable uh, future. Um, from there, 99, 2000, there, were the, there is always the question of le legitimacy of these kind of things, of, of sustainability, of bringing major groups into uh, uh, international processes. And then the UN system started looking what's, what's already there. What are the key aspects of, of sustainability at the UN level? And look, it's all there already. The foundations of the sustainability concept on a global level are there. Um, there's a convention about the human rights. It's about a few decades old. It's about the declaration of the ILO, um, which is a very complex system and also um, adhered to in, in many, many countries. There's the Rio uh, Declaration on the Environment. And last but certainly not least, it's the UN Convention Against uh, 
corruption, um, putting integrity and anti-corruption on the agenda as not just a governance issue, but also as one of the major impediments to sustainable development worldwide. And this is where the UN Global Compact is, is built on. This is our foundation. Um, as a business-driven initiative, um, this is the foundation We're saying, okay, now let's translate this into something we can work with, because communicating to the business uh, community, they like, uh, they like indicators, they like things they can manage. Um, and then the Global Compact came up, certainly, uh, so, sorry, I didn't uh, find the right one, so I took uh, the German ones. Um, but anyway, we don't have to look at the, the uh, individual principles, you can look them up in the internet. Um, but the principles cover the main concepts of sustainability as we see it, about the human rights, the labor standards, the environment, and anti-corruption, and these principles um, are, are geared towards providing the framework for companies to manage sustainably, sustainably their business and to contribute. And this is doing, at least starting with uh, do no harm. Do no harm in the field of uh, labor standards, do no harm in the fields of human rights, also in the environment, and certainly because it is a governance issue and compliance issue on the fields of anti-corruption. Um, the UN Global Compact, now 12 years old, is not alone uh, in, the, in the field when it comes to these global aspirations towards, towards sustainability. What do, company, no, what do countries expect from their companies? How should companies behave when they are on foreign markets, which is a a very interesting uh, question when it comes to a country like Germany, which is quite engaged in quite a few uh, um, foreign markets and having a huge reliance on foreign trade. Um, and here the, the document, the document of choice uh, came from the OECD, um, updated last year, which are the OECD guidelines for multinational companies. Also here you see there is no mention of locals. Well, this is global rules to level um, the playing field and I'm just showing you these things where the OECD put into motion um, a system of rules and regulations that are not binding but there is a, a conflict solving mechanism um, concerning the human rights, the labor standards, environment, anti-corruption, transparency and reporting, taxing and tax payments, uh, very good topic at the time, uh, currently. Um, antitrust and fair competition, consumer protection, knowledge transfer, and, and, and. So there is a, a not global, but at least um, multi, multinational, multilateral agreement um, signed up by the, or developed by the OECD in a multi-stakeholder um, process that gives com companies well, the framework, how they are expected to behave when they are on foreign markets. This is signed by all um, OECD countries plus 10 other countries. Um, not yet signed, uh, not signed by, by China, not signed by India, not signed by Brazil, not signed also by South Africa and certainly also uh, not yet uh, with, with Russia. But what we see, for example, on the Indian level is that the Indian, um, the Indian business associations and the government came up with a set of rules um, that are not called the OECD guidelines for multinational companies, but they heavily draw on them. So there is a convergence also there that they are not reinventing the wheel. Okay, this is the, the framework we are working in on the global level and the global compact came up thinking about, okay, what is our vision? Why, why are we doing this? on the global level? Well, at least we want to shape an integrated, inclusive, the social aspect and sustainable global economy. And we want to address the challenges of globalization through collective action. Meaning, and as uh, Kofi Annan put it, uh, if, we, if, we do not, uh, if globalization does not profit everybody, in the end, it will profit nobody uh, and it will stop functioning. And I think uh, as, as uh, Mr. Superchai said this morning there are uh, already quite a few 
anti-multilateral uh, uh, tendencies in the world that's, uh, that tend in the direction that is not really working. The goals, you saw the 10 principles. Companies are asked to integrate the 10 principles in their business strategies. We are not talking about giving money. We are not talking philanthropy. We are talking about putting the evil at the root. Uh, companies have to change their core business. This is our goal, um, not not giving, doling out monies or building a school to have a good consciousness. Um, the, second, uh, the second very important goal is to fostering cooperation between the various stakeholders. Um, those of you who have been into the international discussion uh, for years know that there were quite strict zealots in, uh, in the past, that civil society not talking to business, business not talking to um, the UN system or to national government so closely. Um, the Global Compact, especially also here in Germany, is working uh, very hard um, to, to bring these silos, uh, silos together. Um, and for those very aspiring companies within the Global Compact, they are also asked to directly support um, partnerships that promote UN goals, especially the Millennium Development Goals. So this is the, the Global Compact at the global UN level. New York is far away. Uh, but how do we bring it onto the ground? That's the real question. And the uh, companies are members of the Global Compact and are in their countries, um, but how do we bridge this distance? And here we come more and more into the concept of locality. Um, over the years, one and a hundred, 101 uh, local networks has been formed by companies and civil society together that signed something of a memorandum of understanding with the Global Compact that the national networks adhere to the principles but are rather independent from the global compact otherwise. So we have to, well, sign a kind of a franchise uh, agreement, um, maybe not as strict or as binding as Subway or McDonald's, but it's, it's going into that way. So we have a, a rather large a leeway of what we are doing, how we're we going to translate it into this concept, um, into the national concepts. So I just got this time about five mi uh, minutes. Um, locality and sustainability, the global localization is the easy translation of locality. Think global, act local, I, uh, I, I already mentioned it before. Um, first, firstly, it came into, into being in the Agenda 2021 uh, um, for the first Rio conference. On the other thing, you have to see that if you're talking about sustainability, you're always talking dilemmas because we are talking about the tragedy of the commons. If somebody uses a certain good, somebody else cannot. Yeah? So property rights and, 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 so quite a few things. Sustainability is not easy and it's not easily quantified. This is a very difficult um, objective for the local networks of the global, uh, net uh, global compact to translate these concepts into national concepts. And there is a, the, the challenge here is finding um, the appropriate local solution without forsaking the principles. Um, we have to do this translation. Translation works without forsaking it. Um, when we come to the discussion, I, I have some rather um, frank questions when it comes to these kind of things. We have to allow the space for local adaptation of the global sustainability um, agenda. And how we do this? in within the UN system, somehow trying to translate it. We have the High Commissioner of, on, on, on Human Rights, we have the ILO, we have UNEP, um, we have the UNCAC and UNODC for the anti-corruption side, and the Global Compact tries to suck up all the initiatives uh, that are directly or indirectly related to business and translate it into business language and we as the local networks are, are charged with doing the translation again from the global level into the special particular situation uh, on the local level. So we are working on translating the concept of human rights to German companies. How can they frame it when they are engaged in other countries? Uh, we are talking about how can they work best together with the ILO? How can they, well, uh, conduct in the environmental friendly way, which is not our biggest topic in Germany because there is quite a, uh, well, as well as civil society and other institutions um, engaged here. 
Coming to an end without giving you the opportunity to show me the second uh, piece of paper for the discussion. Um, as Mr. Superchai this morning also hinted at is the question of how much differenti differentiation is good. Global principles versus local particularities. What we see is that traditions and particularities are often used as an excuse to do some things that are not certainly not, not sustainable. One example is certainly when you, when you come about the topic of labor law and human rights with regard to China. Very difficult aspects. When you talk about um, security, safety in, in your value chains, when you talk about the garment industry, it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, piece of work to do because countries do not like companies or other institutions to interfere with their legal system. So we have to bridge it, right? Um, and we can also see that too much differentiation can be seen as a threat, well, which is a, uh, well, my, uh, my opinion, can be seen as a threat to multilateralism. On the other hand, um, as Mr. Superchai told you this morning also, that we have a differentiating and then getting more and more complex system. And what we learned also as economists is that, that people don't want to live efficient. Efficiency concept uh, is, is not really intrinsic to, 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 to a good life. Not always, certainly. If you are queuing up uh, and, and want your passport renewed, then you want more efficiency. But um, putting this aside, people want to have a good life. And the, the aspects of good life um, and economics do not always match. So there is certain room for differentiation, for different cultures for different business conduct, but we have to find the common ground. And this is also what we say, do not throw uh, the multilateral system out of the window uh, just to promote um, your national image. Thank you very much. This is it for the time being. Um, Dr. Janssen, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we can take perhaps one or two questions. Thank you very much. My name is Cathy Baldwin. I'm a social anthropologist at the University of Oxford, and I'm also a social impact consultant in the environmental department of the UK's largest engineering company, Atkins, built the Olympic Stadium. So I get involved in um, looking at the social impact of the infrastructure that my company is building. Um, this is not, this is deviating from the questions that you set out, but I think one very important issue in terms of the corporate sector genuinely making um, social and, and environmental advances is an issue of personnel. Um, and in terms of um, cross-sectoral collaboration, if, if, say, an engineering firm or a corporate is working with an NGO plus an international organisation and so on, um, there's a, a lack of um, common ground, lack of common language, common understandings of um, goals, market goals versus social goals, that sort of thing. There are communications barriers, there's different kind of jargon that each of the different sectors uses. Um, and I see that there's a lack of good intermediaries, people that are skilled in kind of crossing the boundary between, say, the corporate sector, the NGO world, etc. Um, in my personal experience, it took me a very long time to find a corporate organisation that was interested in having an anthropologist in-house um, and that could take a certain amount of risk in allowing me to progress their social sustainability arena by applying anthropological expertise to it. Um, I'm in the fortunate position of being an intermediary, but um, I, I feel that a lot of corporate companies out there um, are resistant to integrating um, cross-sectoral specialists, and they're extremely frightened of um, taking personnel that can help with this mediation process of building those bridges um, if the people don't come in the form um, of, of a corporate employee. So I often find that um, in the engineering sector, for example, it's engineers um, trying to carry out environmental impact assessment, trying to carry out social impact assessment. Um, I just wondered whether you had a view on what the way forward was um, for sort of um, developing a, a better system of cross-sectoral working and for companies to be more open to this sort of intermediary personnel. Um, you know, if you felt that there was a, a sort of progressive strategy that could be used. 
Yeah, that, that this is this is uh, I think one of the one million dollar question when it comes to to uh, meaningful multi-stakeholder involvement, or also to to open up companies when it comes, for example, to open innovation. Uh, who do you let in, and, and, and what what is a secret, and what, what is mine, and what is open? Um, uh, companies are struggling uh, because the different departments, or, or a lot of companies are struggling because uh, the different departments still remain in their silos. An engineer is an engineer is an engineer. Right? Um, and, and to get him out or her out of this silo and, and open up to, to, to the different thinking of, of life cycle analysis, for example, or, or ecological footprinting and how does this influence innovation, uh, innovative processes, while well, not just put into these processes the technical specifications, but also the impact on society and the environment is, is a huge, well, a, a huge challenge for, for companies. Also, um, the people are not there. So if, if you are one of those persons who can bridge, who is an engineer, for example, by profession, but on the other hand, also understands the, the bigger picture of sustainability, um, there should be some interesting job opportunities out there. Yeah, if you, if you bring somebody else into your company, especially when it comes to decision making, right, strategic decision making, um, you, you have to be reasonably sure that this person has the, its target system aligned to the target system of the company. You do not know this if you have an NGO uh, 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 representative, he has its own uh, target system. Uh, and it, this is, I think this is for, for HR, it's a very, very big problem. Uh, so I think, okay. We, we, we can hire somebody who, had, who was on lecturing or, or, or comes from a university and hire him, but to cooperate on this aspect is very difficult. I know a few companies who do that, but the, um, the bigger part is still reluctant and try to be, well, go for it step by step. Cultural I don't know if that change. is enough. Um, we have time for one more question or comment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jansen. Uh, my name is Hans Sikak from the Philippine Soccer Exchange. I think one of the uh, interesting things of the, uh, I guess, the uh, global uh, compact is, is that uh, perhaps there's a view that it's been driven, I guess, originally by the OECD nations in terms of the, the concept. And, uh, and, and right now, at least in the economic sphere, where uh, developed economies, you know, Eurozone, the U.S., in, in the financial aspect at least, has uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, maybe lost some of its luster, and, and then when you have the BRIC economies coming and emerging in terms of their voice, uh, not just in terms of the uh, economic sphere, but also what, what, what that means. And, and I think what's happening on one, in one end is that, uh, for example, in the discussion of the environment, is that the BRIC economies kind of say, the more developed economies have had their chance to basically develop and therefore uh, this issue or these issues are ba basically being put on them whilst their development stage is not at the same level of uh, developed economies. And then I guess the second point, uh, if you care to comment on it, is that uh, there also seems to be now a relative view of, uh, of differing, let's call it geographic uh, groups, you know, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the BRIC economies, uh, as uh, perhaps uh, uh, resonating more in terms of the various uh, issues, including, by the way, the uh, whether it's issues of the environment or issues about uh, sustainable development, and, and therefore maybe the bigger global compact issues don't get the uh, type of attention uh, it deserves. Uh, would you react to that, sir? I try to. Uh, first of all, there is no global compact network in in the Philippines. <laughs> Um, secondly, yes, uh, it is, it is a, uh, what we see, the differentiation and the uh, shifting of the, uh, of the center of gravity, right, uh, from the old, uh, old Europe or old economy towards, towards the, the BRICS and especially Asia, uh, is being reflected within the, the global compact already. So there is a, a relaunch of the global compact in China. There is a very strong um, 
um, presence of global compact companies, big companies in, in India. So in the BRICS companies, they, they see, especially if these companies are outward looking, uh, export oriented, are on the, on the way of being multinationals, they, they quickly run into the same, not obstacles, but challenges the old multinationals have faced. They are faced with human rights problems. How to deal with an investment in a uh, faraway African country? If I have a brand, it can be it can be difficult for for Haida or for Huawei um, to run into problems with uh, raw materials from the Congo. That has not been on the agenda five or ten years ago. It is now. So we see that uh, that the the companies that are engaged in international trade very strongly, um, and not only on the raw material side, um, are are keen to enter the Global Compact because what, what is the Global Compact doing? We are not a, a standard setting organization. We say there are a set of principles and if you apply these principles to your company, you can frame your sustainability, your sustainability concepts around these things. Forget everything else, <laughs> look at this and the, the, the good thing at these four pillars of the Global Compact is that this is internationally accepted um, and based on, on, on treaties between, uh, between the, the, the governments. You, you don't talk about the human rights. Well, in practice you do, but uh, everybody will at least pay lip service to it. Well, the same is true from all the ILO things. This is the foundation on which to build your, your sustainability efforts to stay in international business and be, be successful. When it comes to, to the environment, well, yes, we will see in the post-2015 development agenda what will happen. Um, we believe that the, the formulation of hard uh, indicators for the environment will be extremely difficult. So what we expect is that they will frame uh, around certain areas and leave scope for companies, uh, for countries to reach certain self-set targets. Um, thank you, Dr. Janssen, for taking the time out to come and speak to us.